And now, you know I have been considering why this concept why this concept of God and going to God? Why do people feel the need to go to God? Or do they feel that need at all? Or they want some kind of mascot? You know, some kind of charm to keep them somewhat on even keel. Why? Why do we go? Now I notice that in the scriptures, some went for healing. Of course, the healing of the body makes us come to a dead stop, doesn't it? When there is a real need. If the devil he were ill, then the devil he would pray. <laughs> so I am afraid many people pray on those terms. If the devil he were ill, then the devil he would pray. So, now, that kind of situation may have overtaken some of us again and again. But, you know, the Lord Jesus taught us to pray, forgive us our transgressions. You know, transgression is breaking of the law of God. First, people seem to be so ignorant of God's word. They go to church, they go through the motions, but they are just ignorant of God's word. A man said to me one day, I am deeply in debt. I said, to whom do you owe that money? Oh, he said, it's a church member. And that church member takes a good deal of interest from me. What? I said, what kind of church is that and what kind of preaching do you have? The Bible says, thou shalt not be a usurer when your brother has fallen into poverty or need. You see, you and I are there to lift him, to help him. But, oh, he said, I belong to this church. You know, I could easily identify the church as a place where people tend to go from one emotional high to another emotional high. You know, some people treat the Church of Jesus Christ as a place of mere entertainment, a dance hall, if you please. No. When we come into the presence of God, God says, Stand in awe and sin not. That sense of awe is gone. You see, especially when there's so much idolatry around us and in our hearts. You know, it's, it's all a symbol. There's no heart there. And therefore, we are happy enough with the symbol. 
just a few marks of religion to satisfy us. But you know, when Jesus taught us to pray, forgive us our transgressions. What a lot of meaning there is. Now, we don't like to offend the law. I remember years ago, an engineer would drive me very often on some of those fast roads in, in Germany and so on. No speed limits on many of those roads. And uh, so the police car used to have a very special green lacquer or paint. And this man, every time he saw a vehicle that was green, his foot would automatically go to the brake. <laughs> I said, what is happening? Oh, you know, that is a police car. <laughs> Well, you see, folks, a sense of, you know, a real respect because the German police, as I could see, were not an easy people to deal with. And you got into their hands, you got into real trouble. So, even for a green-colored police car, you have such a sense of respect. But when it comes to the law of God, forgive us our transgressions. See, the land is full of fornication and adultery. And nobody seems to bother about that. Anything that seems to promote a little bit of excitement is okay. What is the damage being done? the breakup of the home, the cry of the little child, such irreparable damage is being done to the nation and to the economy too. The spread of disease, it's a sin against the nation. And yet, nobody wants to pay any attention. Well, we are breaking the law of God. There is no sense of awe. It's gone. You see, a man can talk his head off. When it comes to philosophy, your opinion is as good as mine. You see, it is all a matter of opinion. It is now, there is no law, in other words. The law of God is perfect, says the Bible, converting the soul converting that inward man. You see, this very nation was based on that concept. We want freedom to worship God. We do not want a religion which is a mere rigmarole. The fulfillment of the saying of some prayers 
and running through some motions. Now you will notice in the seventh chapter of Luke, a woman who came to the Lord Jesus with a very specific purpose. This was not for some material gain. This was not just for some public display. Seventh chapter of Luke, 37th verse. For behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment, and stood at his feet behind him weeping, and began to wash his feet with tears, and did wipe them with the hairs of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now, the location. Would you choose such a location to repent? A dinner table spread out in the house of a religious, orthodox, religious leader. A man given very much to pointing his finger. Religious fellows had better be careful. Our business is not to point the finger, but to lift, give the helping hand. You know, pointing the finger, anybody can do. Throwing stones, anybody can do. And I see a lot of people, religiously inclined, who give themselves to just stone throwing and finger pointing. Now, she chose such a location at least she felt possibly that here I have gotten hold of my Lord. I have access to him somehow or other in this place. He is seated at dinner. You know, normally speaking, you don't want to disturb people on a formal occasion, and uninvited, you don't want to get crash into a house of a stranger where you're already labeled as a persona non grata a person not to be accepted. You're already labeled as a sinner and you're looked down upon. Nobody welcomes you there. Would you get Christ such a place? and say, this is an urgent matter, I must attend to my soul. You know, it amazes me that religion which does not point to the forgiveness of sins is the religion that people want. Why do I go to God? Why can't I lift myself by my bootstraps? 
Isn't there some way to reform myself? You see, some yoga or something by which I say I will join the universal spirit. And we have been joining the universal spirit for ages. without showing anything to it. No moral consequences. No uplift of the poor. No relief from oppression and greed. But religion. Well, what are you talking about? Who wants such a religion? What is that kind of religion? It is a religion without a purpose. It is a religion without a goal. It is a religion without fulfillment of any sort. And people want that kind of religion today. Whatever you may label that religion, It is worthless. And here, this woman came to the point when she said, Whatever my dithering of the past, whatever my waywardness and foolishness and rebellion, I am going to fix it today. I'm going to seize this opportunity and get hold of the feet of Jesus. So she chose that very difficult and unlikely place for repentance. And You see, she did not look around. We are given so much to looking around. What is somebody else doing? It is amazing. Oh, I'm better than the other fellows. I am vastly superior, morally superior to the other fellows. No, she was not at all concerned with the other fellows there. She was just concerned with the Savior. You know, the Bible says in James, the fourth chapter, and the eighth verse, the sixth verse also would give to us the background to this statement. But he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisted the proud and giveth grace unto the humble. God resisted the proud. You know the various things that can make us proud. Our accomplishments our university degrees, the bank balance, our state in society status, all these things make people proud. The trouble is, when you become very wealthy and powerful, you become very proud. You forget to whom you owe these blessings, and you suddenly plummet to the position where you become the greatest debtor nation in the world. Pride. 
God resisted the proud. I don't want to put myself in antagonism to God so that he has to resist me and put me out of the way. But you know, it is all we are living in a society of climbers. Not those who are lifters of others. A Christian is designed to lift others. That's his purpose. But we have chosen the course of clambering and climbing. The economic ladder. Okay. Now, that puts us very far from spirituality. That in itself. Just that one pursuit of money puts us far away at the antipodes from really seeking God. Somehow we don't have the heart for it. We don't have the stomach for it. We don't have the time for it. See, you may indoctrinate a person, you may teach a person, but then, you know, there are always things that gain priority over the living God. God resisted the proud and giveth grace unto the humble. Now the eighth verse says, Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Double-minded. I don't know, friends. <laughs> you know, the decisions that are before nations today are such, you know, the president is being blamed for not making up his mind. Well, you, dec you decided to do something about Afghanistan, but you're not able to make up your mind. Well, it's not an easy decision, especially when a country is losing so many young people. It's not an easy decision, but the fact remains, here is a double mind. I do not know how much a double mind afflicts you in so many of your decisions. You know, a, a decision-making mind is not easy. Commit thy way unto the Lord, and he will bring it to pass. We have moved away from that, isn't it? We weigh the pros and cons and say, Hey, if I did this, I stand to gain. If I don't do this, I may lose. And this is the time to jump on the bandwagon. Oh, there are so many forces in operation. Here the Bible says, And purify your hearts, you double-minded. My dear friends, let us know 
that these feet which were pierced with nails for us, these sinless feet, are objects of worthy adoration. We worship Jesus, the perfect sinless Savior. Let us pray. O oh, my Father, have mercy on the nations. So many still in this world who do not know the name of Jesus, wherever they are, help us to bring hope into their lives. So help us. In Jesus' almighty name, amen.